hello, everyone. You, do, you all missed a very exciting annual meeting, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so now I want to tell you about our speaker, who is not Kirk Dombrowski, who did say when we booked him that he might come or he might send someone else. And he sent someone else, and this is great. <laughs> And it is Douglas, but we're going to call him Doug Merrill. And so let me tell you a little about him. And I wrote this on the back, so it's now it's hard to see. But anyway, Doug Merrill is a seasoned leader with over 30 years of experience in high technology manufacturing businesses. He has served in technical and leadership roles in firms ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies. After graduating from Cornell University, he joined General Electric's manufacturing management program and spent 14 years with GE Energy in roles of growing responsibility and complexity. Doug and his family moved to Vermont in 2005. He has served in executive operations roles for several regional firms, including Husky Injection Molding and Dynapower. Prior to joining the Tech Hub, he was the CEO of Semiprobe, a growing semiconductor test equipment firm based in Winooski. He was an adjunct lecturer in UVM's School of Engineering from 2009 through 2013. In 2023, he rejoined the university in the role of regional innovation officer. And his first assignment was to launch the VGAN Tech Hub. Doug sits on several corporate boards and is a member of Cornell University's Engineering College Advisory Council. He's a board member of the Lake Champlain Community Sailing Center, lives in Shelburne with his wife, Lisa. Please welcome Doug Merrill. Uh, thank you, Carol. That was a great introduction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she gives away my secrets. Um, and uh, for those of you who are really expecting to see Kurt, I apologize. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a poor substitute for Kirk. He's, he's one of a kind. Um, but he did hire me for just this reason, because uh, running the, the Tech Hub is a, is a full-time job. Um, and when UVM won, uh, won the designation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, I, Kirk and I had been talking for quite some time about how I could help UVM uh, grow its outreach to local businesses. And he said, I think this is it. This is going to be a lot of work, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to make a big impact. And so I said, sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, so what is the Tech Hub? Um, the first question I get is, what is it? Where is it? How can I find it? Can I, can I get an office there? Um, and right now, the Tech Hub is simply a consortium. Um, it, it doesn't have a, an actual building. Um, UVM, it, Global Foundries in the state of Vermont are the founding partners. Um, and, uh, and UVM is the lead organization. So UVM is, is providing the administrative support uh, to try and get it launched um, while, uh, while we wait to determine if we're going to be funded by the federal government. Um, and the state and global foundries are both providing quite a bit of support as well. Um, we applied in June of, of last summer, so almost a year ago. Um, there were over 300 applications. Uh, the, the program is designed to bring economic development through technological innovation to rural and underserved communities in the United States. So that was kind of the, the, the mission of of the Economic Development Administration's goal in this program. Um, over 300 organizations applied, and the EDA named 31 uh, organizations across the country as designated tech hubs. That uh, occurred the last week in October. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, I, I joined UVM the first week in November, uh, shortly after our designation. Um, and our first goal was uh, there was a deadline of February 29th to submit our first round of, of projects for funding opportunities. The designation itself came with no money. It was basically a designation that allowed us to use the nice little PDF logo, which you see on the lower right of the screen, um, and it allowed us to apply for this, these funds and participate in a lot of other federal programs, but nothing was funded until we, until we have a, uh, uh, went through a uh, funding submission process. So um, we worked incredibly uh, diligently uh, November through February uh, to, to create our our uh, proposal. Uh, we ended up proposing six projects. Uh, we asked for a total of $36 million in federal support. We have $5 million in matching uh, funds uh, to, to, uh, uh, to go along with that federal support from the organizations that, that uh, requested these, 
to host these projects. Um, and we expect a decision on that this summer. They're saying the June, July timeframe. We had a review with the EDA uh, two week, three weeks ago, um, and that was scheduled. They basically said once we submitted our, our proposal, they would get back to us with a list of clarifying questions at the end of March, which they did. Uh, we submitted that a week later, and then we had a follow-up meeting for about two hours with the EDA um, uh, after that. The meeting went incredibly well. Um, it, uh, it, it's difficult now because I feel like we have a great proposal. We really had a great presentation to the EDA, and I think our questions were, were their questions were well answered. And now I guess we just have to wait, which is really hard. <laughs> the, uh, uh, there's not much else we can do uh, in terms of getting it funded. Um, but one of the questions we have now that I know you know what the Tech Hub is and what it's not is what is gallium nitride? Why are we why are we interested in, in this uh, in this technology? Well, gallium nitride is a semiconductor substrate, and how many, how many people here have worked in IBM or Global Foundries? Anybody? I figured we'd have a couple. So you all know what a substrate is, and, and the most common substrate is silicon uh, in the semiconductor industry, and that's what Global Foundries has used for a long time. But Fab9 has got a track record of using uh, uh, more niche substrates that do different things. Gallium arsenide is probably the most recent one that they've developed devices on, and their gallium arsenide is very, very good at high frequency devices, which is why it's in, in most of your cell phones as the switch that helps determine which antenna to use and which amplifier to use. Um, and gallium nitride is a different substrate. And if, you, if you're, you've probably all seen a pizza and eaten a pizza, the substrate's the dough. That's what you're going to build your device on. And in the semiconductor world, the substrate is, 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 usually, is what you're building your semiconductor device on. You're going to put transistors, resistors, capacitors on top of that substrate. And silicon's a great substrate for, for a lot of a lot, of a lot of applications, and we now have almost 60 years of development experience making progressively more complex devices on silicon. Um, but there are some applications where silicon is, has some limitations, uh, and where, where, where gallium nitride really shines um, is that it has very low resistance when you turn it on as a transistor. It's about an order of magnitude less resistance than silicon. It also turns on and off really, really fast. So you can say be on, be off, be on, be off, about 10 times faster than you can with silicon. Um, and that's because it has high electron mobility. Electrons are what con uh, conduct a current, and the electrons in gallium nitride, that, that based on some of the material properties, just can move a lot more quickly and a lot more freely than they can in silicon. Um, it has a very high breakdown voltage, meaning you can put very high voltages on it relative to silicon without it, without it arcing and decomposing. And it's not nearly as sensitive to temperature and radiation as silicon is. Um, and why are those things important? Uh, they allow it to do some things that silicon is not very good at. The first is LEDs. So uh, the first commercial application of gallium nitride were white, uh, I'm sorry, blue LEDs. And uh, uh, we had red LEDs, we had uh, uh, green LEDs. But once we made blue, we could then make the full spectrum, which is why most Christmas tree lights and every dorm room on campus decorated with LEDs that flash. And that was established in the like late 1990s. That's a commodity market now. Uh, Global Foundries really isn't interested in pursuing LEDs. Uh, we aren't either. But the other two applications, we are very interested in pursuing. So high power devices. Uh, as, as many of you know, we're st starting to see more and more electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Um, and uh, question? Oh, sure. Move it up. Yep. Okay. I'll do my best and I will try to slow down. And feel free to raise your hand and say, you're talking too fast again. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Is the sound better with it further up? Okay, great. Thank you. So, so so gallium nitride devices are really good at conducting a lot of power and turning it on and off. And we're seeing that in electric cars. Um, we've got a company uh, just down the street, Beta, uh, electric planes. And there's a, there's a real movement to try to electrify a lot of applications that historically we've uh, powered with fossil fuels or hydraulics or mechanics. Um, and gallium nitride devices will help us do that. It makes the electronics that drive 
motors and charge batteries and convert power from one voltage to another, those electronics become more efficient, they become smaller, and they become cheaper. So that's, that's the first market that we think we're going to see a lot of demand for these devices in. The second, as I mentioned, is that they turn on and off really, really fast. Um, and I'm not talking light switch fast, we're talking uh, radio frequency uh, amplifier fast. And as we've seen cell phones go from 3G to 4G to 5G, and now they're talking 6G, the G is a generation, and each generation the frequency is getting uh, higher. Because you, that allows you to transmit more information in the same amount of time. And so the cell phone manufacturers are already looking at 6G. You'll have more information. Your videos will stream faster. Um, and uh, GAN devices are great for making amplifiers and switches in a higher frequency sector. So the expectation is that GAN will displace gallium arsenide in a lot of the applications we see it in right now. So this is a pictogram of, of what we propose to the EDA. Um, we have, we've got some administration at the top. That's me. It's a pretty small uh, project, but it, it comprises all of the personnel that will make this work. Um, at the center, we have what we call our innovation core. And that is kind of the technical engine that makes this whole process work and is going to accelerate the development of these semiconductor devices. And on the left, we have a workforce development program. One of the big concerns we have in the nation uh, right now, we passed the CHIPS Act. We're deploying literally billions of dollars into communities around the country to grow our semiconductor business. But will we have enough uh, employees and trained, uh, trained technicians, engineers, scientists to actually get all this work done? Anybody that's tried to have home repairs done, it doesn't matter if you have a checkbook if you can't find anybody to do the work. And the, the semiconductor industry is struggling with that nationwide. So we have uh, an $8 million workforce development program where we're working with K through 12 schools across the state, trying to make sure our children have access to great uh, STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, trying to make sure that it is current and kind of exciting so that children are not put off by it. They're like, wow, that's something I can do. Math could be fun. Um, up through the community college network. Uh, we have apprenticeship programs for technicians and operators at manufacturing companies. And then we're working with uh, UVM and Norwich and Dartmouth on, uh, on bachelor's and graduate level programs. We've got the engineers, material scientists, the physicists, and the computer scientists uh, graduating in sufficient enough numbers to A, backfill the retirements that we're seeing, but also to fill the, the additional jobs we think will be created uh, because of this. Um, and I'm going to zoom in here on the, what I call the innovation core uh, on this next slide. Actually, oh, before I did that, no, here it is. Um, so the innovation core are, are three projects, uh, each of which is hosted by a different organization. And they start with what we call our Advanced Design Computing Center. And that computing center is, is a, it's a physical stack of computers that we'll, we will purchase for this, uh, about, a, I don't know, a million and a half dollars worth of computers. And they're configured to run software that designers use to design semiconductors. Uh, that software is referred to as EDA software, Electronic Design Automation. And it is the software that a designer will use to lay out a circuit to say what they want to do. Uh, it then simulates the inputs and the outputs of that circuit to make sure that it's, it is performing the function, the electrical function the designer intends. And then it allows them to actually, kind of like an architect, build that onto silicon, because it now has to take that circuit, which has lines that represent wires and, and wiggles that represent resistors, transistors. It then has to build that in a 3D architecture on, on the silicon or on the gallium nitride. Um, and then it goes back and it does the testing again. And now that I've built it, will this electrically function the way we hope it will function? And uh, the, the EDA software providers, most of them are based in the United States, and they're really kind of one of the hidden assets of the semiconductor world. They don't get as much attention as, as the big factories that Micron and Global Foundries operate, or the 
the enormous stereolithography machines that ASML in the Netherlands produces, those are out as kind of the secret of the semiconductor revolution. But these software programs are staggeringly complicated um, and really powerful. Right now, there, I mean, if you think about a chips that are, that are powering your iPhone, I believe they have several billion transistors on each one. And if you think about how, how you would connect them all together, and they've got different layers to connect them to silicon, it would take a human centuries to figure that out. But this software will do it using AI, do all that routing for you. And it's really good on silicon because it knows those properties and it knows those processes as we've been doing it for 60 years. It doesn't really understand gallium nitride very well. And the companies that make the software know that. They're really eager to partner with us because they want to learn about gallium nitride and get their software up to the state of the art. And so the, the, the three primary companies that are interested in this market are a company called Cadence Design, um, Keysight, and then Siemens, bought Mentor Graphics. Um, and they're each, they've each signed up to say, we are going to provide this software to, to the tech hub um, at basically the academic rate, so the teaching rate, which is a, typically about 10% of what a company would pay. Um, and for reference sake, uh, if, if any of you wanted to go out and start a semiconductor company and buy one of these software packages, it costs about $400,000 a year to have one user license of a full suite. So they're staggeringly expensive. Um, sure. Periodic table, sure. Yep. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's a, that's a good point. Um, so gallium is is a metal. Um, it's it's located, I think, close to mercury, um, and it shares some properties with mercury in that it's. Uh, it has a very low melting point. And one of the unique properties of gallium is it melts at, I should know the exact temperature, but it's a, in the high 80s Fahrenheit. And so if somebody hands you a, a ball of gallium and you squeeze it, you can liquefy it just by holding it. Um, and so uh, it is a, not a, considered a rare earth element, and there aren't any gallium mines. Gallium typically is found when you are mining bauxite, zinc, or copper. And it's one of the sort of the trace minerals that is usually just sort of thrown away. But there is a secondary market in it for the semiconductor uh, industry. So um, the, the, the bauxite and zinc and copper miners will sell the ore that has, that's heavy in bauxite to refiners who will then refine it into uh, metallurgical grade bauxite, uh, metallurgical grade gallium. Um, and then it's combined, I don't know how, it's somehow combined with, uh, uh, into a gas. Um, I'm not sure what, what its properties are. And that's how it's used by the foundries. So the foundries will bring this uh, gas that has a lot of gallium in it, and they use a chemical vapor deposition process, a lot of heat, to basically precipitate the gallium and nitrogen down on top of it to make a small layer on the silicon. And we're talking about a layer that is one to two atoms thick. There's a very minuscule amount of, of gallium um, on top of the silicon that, that gives it this property. When Global Foundries is running at full capacity, the, the entire Fab 9 is making all gallium nitride substrates, they estimate they'll use about 300 pounds of gallium a year. So it's, it's being used in very minute quantities. But that's important to know. We're not talking about rail cars full of ore coming into Vermont or anything like that. It's a, it's a very much a trace element that has a profound effect on the performance of these. Sure, no, it's an excellent question. And, and six months ago, I, I had no idea either. I'd heard of gallium, but I didn't know what it looked like, <laughs> where you got it. Um, and I used to, I joked with one or two people that, oh yeah, it's camel sumps made of gallium, we're gonna mine it. Um, and a lot of people at UVF said, that's not funny. <laughs> That'll get quoted, um, and, and we're not. Um, so, uh, so our first project is this computing center. Um, and we're, we're, we're really excited about that. It's going to be hosted in, in South Burlington. 
Um, but users will log into it. So uh, Tech Hub members will uh, join the Tech Hub. They will be given licenses to, uh, they will apply for licenses to use uh, our software um, for, for specific projects. One of the key uh, criteria to be a member of the Tech Hub is you have to be in our region. The whole program was, was funded to spur economic development and technological development in rural and underserved areas. And so if you are doing software design, you are in anywhere in Vermont, we'd love to talk to you. If you are in the counties, uh, two counties north and south of Dartmouth, of Hanover, I can't remember the names of the counties, um, that's great. If you are in the four northernmost counties of New York State, going all the way up to Clarkson, terrific. But if you're in Boston, or in San Francisco, or in Austin, Texas, you, you don't have access to the software at this rate. And that's not an accident. We're not trying to be exclusive. But we are, what we're trying to do is create an environment where if you want to have the expertise uh, in applying products we are building here, you need to design them here. Not apologetic about that. That's just part of the nature of how we've designed it. Um, so the next, the next uh, uh, project is the prototyping center at the bottom. And that's a, a center that global foundries will operate within their existing fab. Um, it's been difficult for small companies in the past that have an idea to get global foundries or any of the very large fabs to actually produce their idea in a small scale. You go to global foundries and say, I've got this idea for a new device. They say, well, how many million do you want? I want three or four to see if my friends like them. Um, and they just have never had the infrastructure to do that. And so inventors have had to go to what they call uh, prototyping fabs around the country and test out their ideas. And if those ideas work, and there seems to be a market for them, then they can go to Global Foundries. Global Foundries will say, that's great, but we're going to need to completely redesign your product to work on our fab. And that's, a, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of redesign. And most, many, many great ideas die at that point can't afford. They've raised some money, they've gotten the prototype, they think they're ready, and they don't have any more money to, to develop that process again. This prototyping center won't suffer that problem. The, the devices will be made three to four times a year. Global Foundries will allocate a production run of prototype devices for Tech Hub members. Uh, so they'll be on a schedule. So if, you're, if you've got a great idea and you design it, you'll know that, okay, my deadline is the next prototype run starts April 1st. I need to have all of my design information to Global Foundries by April 1st. Otherwise, I'll have to wait till June 1st. But you can plan on it. And if you have investors, you can tell them, here's what I'm going to do, here's when we will build it, and here's when we will get our prototypes back. It's not, it won't be done when Global Foundries gets around to it or has extra time scheduled. And our, our final... Uh, Innovation core uh, element is a test and characterization laboratory. And that's going to be a laboratory. It's about $3 million of equipment that is designed to uh, characterize the semiconductor devices that are made by Global Foundries um, and perform testing on, on the individual devices, on the devices after they're packaged, after they're put into their sort of plastic packaging, and then once they're put into a circuit board so that customers can see, are they doing what we thought they would do? And the real magic happens, and you can sort of see there's a couple arrows. The thick arrows are the actual product. We have a design and then a device. But we've got two thin arrows, and the data from those tests gets, sent, gets shared with the EDA providers and global foundries. Because as I mentioned, the software providers know that their modeling isn't very good. So if you make a device, you design a device, you have it made, and you test it, and you don't get what you thought you'd get, Either Global Foundries did not manufacture it properly, or the software company did not simulate it properly, because you did not get what you simulated. And so the whole role of this is to figure out where, did, where was that mistake made. And so that if you're not getting what you expected, you'll know quickly, we'll share it with, with, with either the software or the hardware provider, and then you can go back and fix it. Our hope is that we can accelerate the innovation cycle by a factor of two through this closed loop. And, and to participate, you have, the inventors have to, they go into this knowing that that performance data will be shared with the software provider and with the fab. Um, and those, two, those companies will protect that data. They're not going to sell it to somebody. It, it will be kept secure.
So this, as I said, this is going to increase the speed at which we see uh, innovation happen in, 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 in the region. And it does this in a couple ways. One is it lowers the cost so that smaller companies can come to global foundries with novel ideas. If the tech hub didn't exist, global foundries, they, they've already launched their gallium nitride fab. They're, they're going to they're gonna start building, they're building pro products right now. But small companies wouldn't participate. And they know that really good, really good ideas and really bad ideas come from small companies. But you don't know if it's a good or a bad idea until you try it. And so the, by lowering the cost of prototyping and designing, our expectation is we're going to see a much broader spectrum of ideas going through the fab. And they'll be, be into, able to explore what they can do and how these devices work, where they work well, where they don't work well. And the state of the art will advance much faster than if we weren't able to do this. As many of you who've, in many fields, realize, you learn a lot more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. In the semiconductor industry, mistakes are really expensive. And our goal is to really drop the cost of making those mistakes. We learn. We get to the successes that much faster. So how will it work? Um, this is the question I'm getting asked a lot these days from potential companies that are thinking about trying to set up operations here. Um, and I'm not going to go through all this, but as I've said, members have access to these resources. They'll pay a membership fee to belong. Um, it, that fee depends on how big the company is. Small companies will pay 100 bucks a year. Big companies may pay $25,000 a year. Um, and then they'll pay for the resources that they're using. Uh, but in general, it'll be half to 75% less than if they were not a tech company. It's a big discount. We've also got a, uh, a scholarship program. So for, for company, small companies, that even these reduced fees are a barrier. We, we can provide scholarships, particularly for uh, populations that have traditionally been underserved in semiconductors. The women-owned business, minority-owned businesses, uh, the EDA and the semiconductor industry really wants to encourage participation, drive these populations up, mainly because we need the people. We can't afford to not have a population in here. So everybody's welcome. And it's been hard in the past. So we've got some money in, this, in that $36 million that I think about a million and a half in scholarships to make to lower these barriers. I think I've covered the rest of that. And we see this sort of growing in three phases. Um, we'll find out in June or July if we're funded, and if we are, uh, we expect to be operating next January. We will hire our engineers, we will order our equipment in the fall, and we'll open our doors in January. The first two years are kind of the building blocks, making sure we have our processes right, we understand how to get products developed, we understand what the capabilities are, getting the workforce play, uh, uh, development program rolling to start getting students coming through here. Um, and then two to five years is really where we're going to see a lot of growth in the program. And if we do our jobs right, and this is successful, I think we're going to see a lot of national companies opening design offices here or collaborating with local companies to take advantage of it. We're going to begin to see faculty members and graduate students having ideas on a better way to use gallium nitride to solve an existing problem, starting a company, take advantage of that. Um, and in four to ten years, we're going to begin to see some of these companies actually really growing, become significant employers. And our hope is that this doesn't all happen in Chittenden County, but we're really purposely trying to spread this out um, across the state. Uh, we've got great wideband coverage through many areas of the state, but not everywhere. Um, and much of this activity is design work. As long as you've got a strong broadband connection, you can do that pretty much anywhere. Um, and the goal is by, by year five or six, the tech hub itself gets spun out of UVM. We will actually have a building that you can drive up to it and see it. Um, and that building will have an incubator space for small companies to try to build their, their designs and test them. Um, we're hosted, uh, we will be hosted by OnLogic initially. So OnLogic just built a brand new headquarters here in South Burlington behind the whale's tails. Uh, it's gorgeous if you haven't seen it. They're doing an open house second week in May. I urge you to take a look. Um, but they built that facility to last them 20 years. And they, they were very honest about the fact that we, we're not, we can't fill it right now. We didn't want to build it again. We have space. So we would love to have the tech hub 
characterization lab in our space. Gorgeous. Can't wait to move into that. Uh, um, but they also said it's, we do expect to grow, and so five or six years from now, you need to come up with what your next phase is. So we'll be there for five years, and then we'll move into our own, own, uh, own facility after that. But what does, it, what does it mean? Why are we doing all this? Uh, well, there's really three reasons I see uh, that I'm excited about. The first is jobs. The semiconductor industry tends to pay quite well at all, at all education levels. This isn't just for engineers and, and scientists. Technicians, uh, the operators in, in the fabs uh, tend to be paid quite well. Um, and they're upwardly mobile jobs. Take a job right out of high school as an operator, and there's already programs in place with CCV to go to school uh, while you're working so you can, as I say, le uh, learn while you earn, earn while you learn. Um, if you don't have the luxury of going back to school full time, you don't have to. And you can get your associate's degree, and then you can keep taking, get your, your, your bachelor's degree. So these are careers that you can grow while you're working and, and supporting a family. Um, there are a lot of incentives here for young people to come to Vermont. Semiconductors are a growing industry across the nation, and I'm starting to think young people, it's, it's kind of back to the 70s and 80s where they're, they're becoming interesting again. Um, and, uh, uh, and Vermont has a reputation as a great place for young people to live um, if they can find jobs. Housing is, is the next big problem, and we spend a lot of time talking about housing, why it can't all be in Chittenden County. There are communities in the state that have got a lot of empty housing, and no jobs and no people. Um, and so we need to bring them some jobs and some people. Um, but it's also going to, the technology is, is exciting because it, it does two things. One is it really helps uh, with the conversion uh, to, to the renewable grid. Um, wind turbines, solar panels, batteries all operate at different voltages than the appliances we have in our house. So, Gallium nitride is really, really good at changing voltages and changing frequency. It makes that transition much more robust, much less expensive, much more efficient. The other aspect, and part of the reason that Global Foundries was asked to go down this road in the first place, is national security. High frequency devices aren't just good for your cell phones, they're exceptionally good at radar. So uh, that's, that's one of the reasons that, the, that Washington is very, very interested in this technology, and, and we're happy to serve in that respect. Um, the, the radar applications are terrific. And those do trickle down to, to uh, consumer applications as well with self-driving car, uh, radar for, for adaptive cruise control, things like that. And then finally, as I mentioned, we're putting a lot of uh, resources into the education system. A lot, of, particularly in K through 12. Um, and I, I live in Shelburne in the next town down, and I'm sure South Burlington's had the same concerns about our tax uh, burden for education. So we're putting a lot of funds into the education system that hopefully will offset some of those costs that the residents are currently being there. Um, and it makes the education system better for everybody. But we're not asking fourth graders to agree to work in the semiconductor industry if they take our courses. They're all getting this great education. And we're hoping that, that some of them sort of flow into the semiconductor. Those are the three real benefits to the state that we see. When I, actually it was before I took this role, um, I, I, I guess I had agreed to take it, but I wasn't in the role yet. We, UVM had arranged a, uh, sort of a community visioning session down in Hula in Burlington to talk about what we were gonna do with this. Some, some of you may have been there. Um, and everybody's excited, but there were some things that we, were all, we all agreed we didn't want. We don't, nobody is interested in us becoming the next Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas. And the gallium nitride is a nice, uh, is, 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 happens to be, I think more by luck than by planning, um, a, a great avenue for this because we don't need a new fab. We already have fab nine built in six junction. It has plenty of capacity. Um, I don't think we could build a fab in Vermont if wanted to, at least not in the next 10 years. It would be very difficult from an environmental review process and a cost process, but we don't need to. So the jobs and the companies we're talking about attracting 
are fairly small scale. These are companies that will have dozens, maybe hundreds of employees, um, and they can be spread across share the wealth across the state. Um, and so I think it fits into the Vermont culture really, 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 really well. I didn't, I didn't, that was not my architecture. It, it happened that way, which, which is fortuitous. Um, so we, we will begin uh, attracting talent and technology to the area. Um, we believe that's the reason UVM is excited about this is not because we have a really strong semiconductor physics program. We're doing this because we want more opportunities for our students when they graduate. And we want to make sure smart people are moving to this area. Faculty members have companies to collaborate with. Faculty members often have spouses that need jobs in the technology area. So we're basically looking at this as a way to bring more high technology activity and jobs into the region, in a holistic sense. Um, but we think in the result, we're going to see a lot of startup activity. Uh, and we will actually see the engineering program at UVM and Dartmouth grow because of this. We certainly hope it will. Um, we've had an incredible number of partners. This is not just UVM, the state of Vermont, Global Foundries. Uh, we had, I think, 65 letters of commitment and support that got submitted with our application. I've got some of them on here. Most of them are, are local companies, but you'll see some national names, too, like Intel and Raytheon, uh, or RTX, they, they're called now. Um, it, 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 the amount of interest we've had in this program is just unbelievable. Um, and it, we, after we submitted our proposal, we took the whole team that was writing it out to uh, have a nice uh, dinner at Burlington Beer Company. And we had over 50 people involved. These were all people that had, had a hand in writing this proposal. It was an enormous effort. 50 people from, I think, 30 organizations. It was, it was a big effort. This is not a UVM ship by any stretch. I think this, is the, this was the last slide I, we presented to the Economic Development Agency two weeks ago. Um, Gallium nitride has been proven as, as a winning technology, being deployed uh, across, the, across the, the world. Most of you, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning, that the first application after LEDs was if you noticed 2022, if you bought a new phone since 2022, the, the, the little adapter for your power got smaller and your phone charged faster. That's because the phone charging company switched over to gallium nitride. And it's a very simple device, it's very low cost, but basically your phones are charging twice as fast and your charger is losing half as much electricity, heat. So, so GAN is here, we know it works, we know it works really well. We're now at the phase where we're going from very simple devices like a little cell phone charger to drives for Teslas, radar systems, cell phones. The question is who's gonna win that technology war? Where, where will the, that expertise live? Um, we would like it to live here. Um, it's a niche market. It's never going to be, uh, Dan is not, you're not going to build CPUs and GPUs, the graphics processing units that drive AI machines. Those aren't going to get built on GAN. So we're not going to see these multi billion dollar fabs built on gallium nitride. It's a niche market. It's always going to be. But it's really important and it makes it a great fit for us. Um, the final reason that we think our proposal was really compelling for the DDA is we're ready to go. Some of the other proposals, their primary proposals, they want to build a really big building and start thinking about what to do with it. And hire, we're not doing any of that. We're ready to go. We're going to take the money. We're going to buy some test equipment. We're going to hire some engineers. We're going to begin training students like in January. So money will get deployed right now. Um, I think that was a key differentiator for us. We're optimistic that hopefully the Department of Commerce shares our view and our enthusiasm and fund us. I think that's all I had. Oh. Question from the front. Uh, do we have a mic? Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, application of gallium nitrite, uh, I, I gather from what you're saying, it's a substrate that all the uh, 
the uh, circuitry is is produced is 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 created on like the silicone prior to it. Sure. So uh, as as a uh, power distribution network, sort of like the circuitry would be directing the electricity, right? So where would this technology or could this uh, technology uh, interact with something such as the the uh, power uh, storage and uh, battery situation like uh, 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 an element like graphene. Are you familiar with it, yeah. graphene? Yep. So would, would this be able to be part of that? Could you use, because you're going to need, a, like in a phone, you need a uh, battery. And the capacity uh, for, uh, for uh, power storage with graphene compared to, say, lithium yeah. is, is just exponentially higher. And it's an exponentially smaller. Right. So, w will they ever be using graphene like this with this technology? I, I believe so. Um, so, w where the, the gallium nitride excels is in being able to, to modulate, turn on or off, or modulate electricity. So, if you have a battery out of graphene or lithium, and you want to either charge it or Discharge it. You're right. Conduct it. Conduct it. You're you're talking conductors. Yep. And control it. And and the semiconductors are are semiconductors, meaning they can either conduct or they can insulate. Um, depending, because if you just want to conduct, you can use copper or gold or things like that. If you just want to insulate, you can use plastic. Semiconductors can do both, depending upon how they're biased. So you're going to they're going to be connected to a power source and a and a, and a power use. And then a control circuit, and that control circuit turns them on and off. And the nice thing about gallium nitride is it, it, it is really, really efficient when you turn it on. Um, and when you turn it off, it can have much, much higher voltages across it than silicon can. And so when you're trying to do energy storage now, so the circuits that they, they build at DynaPower right now is a world leader in, in connecting battery storage banks to the grid. And so they'll have, they use silicon carbide transistors. And they're discrete transistors, and they're, they're good at what they do, but each transistor is very large. And then it has to be driven by a small, uh, uh, or not so small, silicon-based uh, transistor drive circuit. And the, the, the goal with, with, with uh, gallium nitride is that entire assembly gets shrunk down into one, one chip. So the chip itself has very, very high power capabilities. And you don't, now you don't have the reliability problems that you have soldering together a silicon carbide transistor with a CMOS uh, uh, control circuit and a bunch of resistors. It's, it's all in one integrated circuit. It makes it smaller, cheaper, um, and more efficient. Um, so yeah, as, as, the, as we find better battery technologies, and I'm confident uh, over the next, I, 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 my prediction is over the next 40 years, we're going to look back at our Tesla batteries, and it's going to be uh, like us looking back now at the cars we were driving in the 70s with chokes and and, and carburetors, be like, we waited 20 minutes to charge a battery? It should take a minute. Um, so I, cause I agree. I think battery technology is going to be, we're going to see huge, huge leaps in it. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be able to take advantage of that. Sure. No, great question. So this is, I don't know why I haven't heard about this before, but. <laughs> It's pretty I mean, new. <laughs> I, 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 I listen to VPR and I read seven days and nobody seems to be talking about it. Or I, had, I missed that article. Um, so this sounds so revolutionary. I'm wondering who else is doing it someplace else? Who is the competition for Vermont for monopolizing this? <laughs> sure. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so as I mentioned before, you can, uh, you can open up a semiconductor component catalog, mouse or digikey, and buy gallium nitride transistors today. They're on the market. Um, and 90% of the ones you buy, it doesn't matter whose name is on it, there's about a dozen manufa manufacturers, 95% of them are actually built in one fab in Taiwan by uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Um, it's, a, it's a very old uh, semiconductor fab, uh, older than uh, uh, fab nine, um, and it's a smaller fab. So they're very limited in what they can produce. Um, the, they, they simply don't have the post-processing options that we have here in Fab9. And the question is, is, is TSMC is a really well-run, really smart company. Um, 
And as I mentioned, this is a really a niche product. And the, the intelligence we have so far basically is, has indicated TSMC is really focused on getting into the next round of AI chips uh, with, with GPUs for NVIDIA and things like that, GPUs and really advanced memory chips. They, don't, they haven't telegraphed to the market that they're going to try to stay current with gallium nitride. It's not to say they won't. Um, they could. Um, but right now, there's nobody that's publicly, other than Global Foundries, publicly said, we are going to take a current fab and, and dedicate it to gallium nitride um, and move forward on that and try and see how much we get out of it. Right now, no one else is doing that. If we're successful, I'm sure people will copy us. There's no question. Um, and, and somebody up at Franklin County Industrial Development Corporation asked, well, what about if somebody discovers another element that's even better? I don't think that's a what if. It's a when. I mean, it's, we're going to keep seeing innovations. And this gallium nitride, hopefully it's going to buy us a decade of, of really great market, market uh, superiority. But if that doesn't mean that scientists can go home and say, we're done, we fixed it. Semiconductors are evolving. And in 10 years, we will have to find the next innovation. So, so there is competition out there. I think we are leading it, but we better not slow down. <laughs> Here's a Zoom question. Oh. What voltage range can GAN handle, and what sort of current or current density? <laughs> um, so currently, uh, most GAN devices are in the, like 100, the 50 to 100 volt range. So your cell phone chargers, things like that. Um, are in that range. The products that are getting developed now, and the first products that Global Foundries will bring to market, are going to be in the 600 volt. So they're really aiming for the electric mobility, uh, uh, motor drive, and, and, and electric mobility battery charging circuitry. So within the next year or so, I think we will start seeing 600 volt devices uh, becoming common. Um, I don't know the current density. I'm not a semiconductor physicist. I've read it. I'd have to look that up. So I don't know the answer to that question. And I, I will mention that there are a lot of efforts out there to bump that voltage threshold up over 1,000 volts. Not commercially available yet, but there are numerous companies, and I know Global Foundries is intending to do this too, to end up with voltages well over 1,000. The person who asked that question just said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello. Um, well, you haven't mentioned the environmental impact of all this um, fabrication of, of chips. And um, uh, I think that um, there are th the, the chips, as I understand it, are largely made by something called a for Forever Chemicals, PFAS. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, PFAS? Yeah, I know what PFAS are. I, I don't know that the extent that they're used in the uh, chemical, in the, in the process. I yeah. Not a well, it turns out that Global Foundry's PFAS air emissions in Vermont are documented at over 262 metric tons for the past 12 years, so on and so forth. Is that a lot or a little? Um, these discharges have increased from 218 pounds in 2021 to 486 pounds. Now this is stuff, it's called um, Forever Chemicals. It goes into the water uh, around global foundries and therefore into Lake Champlain. And, um, and this is all being done with our money, with our uh, federal money. And so I'm wondering to what degree you, there is um, Concern with this issue, and is there an alternative to um, making the clips, uh, the um, making these um, fab to fabricate these things to um, use to not use a PFAS? There's something called the International Chemical Secretariat that finds substitutes for safer alternatives to these toxic chemicals. So just would like a few sure. words on that. So I don't know the specifics of Global Foundry's PFAS uh, use or emission. Um, the, uh, I know I, I'm familiar with the PFAS chemicals, and they're used in a lot of industries. Um, what I do know is, is Global Foundries, uh, both here in Essex Junction and in their other facilities, um, has a, 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 uh, a very, very strong program in driving the sustainability of their products 
uh, for all aspects, both chemicals, energy efficiency, water efficiency. Um, it's, a, it's a large team that's working on it. Uh, so in a couple different ways, energy efficiency is one way, driving down the amount of energy we're using to produce these chemicals, because it, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of electricity. I believe, I believe Global Foundries is the largest electricity user in the state, and that's expensive. Um, and it's also using electricity, which we'd rather not do. So they have got a large team focused on reducing the amount of inputs it takes and the amount of emissions they release um, into the environment. Um, I can't speak to, like I said, the PFAS in particular, but I've, I've been through several of their presentations showing a lot of the efforts they're doing. And I think on their website, they've got a pretty good description of their global program to replace uh, a lot of these hazardous chemicals with far more benign chemicals. And it's not just global foundries. A lot of the major chip fabs are doing this because they, I mean, they all understand that if, if they pollute, they're going to they're clean it up. The days of just being able to dump things into the river are long. Um, and I had the good fortune of being on a tour of the global foundries uh, labs about two months ago. And their chemistry labs are phenomenal. And most of what they're doing is monitoring their wastewater to make sure that there is no pollution in it whatsoever. I mean, they've got several PhD chemists. Um, I was blown away with how much effort they put into this. And it's a, it's a hard problem. There's no question that making semiconductors uses a lot of really dangerous chemicals. Um, one of the real things I like about the Tech Hub is Global Foundries is good at that. They're responsible actors. And we don't have to do that part of this process. That is all contained within Global Foundries. Small companies struggle to handle these things safely. Oh, sure. No, I'd like to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, PFAS uh, chemicals are great concern for a lot of industries. The question. Yeah, question. Thank you. Like everyone else, very impressive, very interesting, exciting. A sort of almost, uh, almost like, wow, what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you touched on some other challenges, uh, and I wonder if you could perhaps expand on it. When you mentioned about the letters of support, if I, if I understand correctly, three cities also su submitted letters of support, including South Burlington. Correct. And uh, as you suggested, that many of the challenges as this grows, develops, will be the challenges that Beta uh, on Logic are already facing. Workforce, workforce being a challenge because of housing, schools, daycare, health care providers, you know, all, all, all the litany of, of things that we have seen. I, in this approach of yours, is there a, a role for the Tech Hub in terms of coordinating a collective effort of the cities? You know, in Vermont, every city is very keen on maintaining its unique identity, uh, but you know, it sounds like the, the footprint of support necessary is going to require quite active coordination among the various cities uh, throughout Vermont, but it particularly right here in this Chittenden County area. It is. I, I, I don't, it, I mean, we, the Tech Hub isn't going to be building houses. I don't, I don't think anybody expects it to, but we have, it has been a catalyzing event, and uh, for me, I didn't realize this was unusual, but um, we ended up putting together a, just a meeting um, probably in December, uh, and it, we had it here in the South Burlington uh, Police Station, and we ended up with the city planners from South Burlington, Burlington, Colchester. We had a se several different cities all sitting together talking about this. Um, and I'm told that was actually pretty unusual. It was the first time that some, some of them had actually met to sort of discuss this. Um, and we all love our individual, the individual characters of our towns. Um, but there is something that we miss in Vermont by not having sort of the countywide planning authorities because uh, we sub-optimize. And we are absolutely uh, eager. And it's not just the tech hub. UVM is with our Center for Rural Partnerships is, is really eager to get involved and get engaged to try and link up where do we have the ability to, to build housing, where do we have unfilled housing, and where do we have uh, uh, companies that are looking to create jobs to try and match them. Um, and I've spent a fair amount of my time working with a lot of the industrial development corporations, economic development corporations, to make sure that they, that they can share this message with their town council in terms of if they want jobs from an initiative like this, what does the town have to do to be ready for it? And the answer is you've either got to have housing stock or be ready to build housing stock. You have to have um, some light industrial space either built or ready to be built. And you better have daycares and schools with some capacity. 
in, in good shape. Because that's what employers want. I, I, there's no way I can make an employer set up a facility anywhere. Um, they're going to go where their employees want to be. And so you've got to create communities that are, that are enticing. And that's one of the reasons I, I took this role, is I, I really am excited about trying to, trying to help shepherd some of that development. Um, because I really, I was in an event last night with the young professionals of Vermont, I'm in Burlington, and Kevin Chu from the Vermont Futures Project spoke there. And he talked about how they're expecting, Vermont, they, they, they feel Vermont needs to grow by 80,000, 80 or 85,000 uh, people to sort of meet the, the, the productivity need to basically ease our tax burden so we can have the services we want. Um, and the question is, where will they be? And if, if, if they're all going to be in Burlington, I think a lot of us will be pretty unhappy. We didn't choose to live here because we wanted to live in Boston. Um, and so the question is, how do you make young people want to be in St. Albans or Rutland or St. Johnsbury, not all want to be in Burlington? Burlington's great, but we need to make the other communities. The extent that we can do that by bringing some of these high-tech companies in and bringing them around the state, we're, we're really happy to do that. Any other questions? This is so exciting. Oh, one more. Well, I was coming to rescue. <laughs> What is a fab factory? Yeah, so thanks for asking that. A fab is, a, it's, it's short for fabrication, and it's, it is a, the shorthand for a place where you make chips. Yeah, it's a, not sure who, when it got shortened to fab, but yeah. So uh, most of the people in the industry, and I shouldn't use that without defining it, is fab is a semiconductor factory. This is Great terrific. Question. Thank you so, so much. Very exciting. You asked great questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.